When you have done something for 10 years, you're said to be good in your craft. When you have done that same thing for 20 years, you become someone who has carved a niche for yourself in that area or field. When you have done 30 years, you become an authority. And that is who my guest for this week has become. If you call him um, a political analyst, you are still on the same line of positivity. If you call him someone who has a vast understanding of happenings around him, then you have also spoken well. He was recently given a Lifetime Achievement Award thanks to Silverbird Group. He was named the Man of the Year. He's none other than Atmoyota Aleluya Akohome, generally referred to as Alibaba. This interview is not your regular. Yes, you've heard him crack jokes, but in this particular interview, he shared more, some things that you haven't heard. Welcome to the exclusive with Kenya Ajumobi. Promises to be an exciting time. I had wanted to be a lot of things. Uh, growing up, uh, I grew up around books, um, books, radio, uh, newspapers, and uh, a lot of reading materials. And so my, my major influences were literary. Uh, the other influences were stretched imaginations. Uh, and stretched imaginations were something like your Nikata books, James Hadley Chase, Harold Robbins, Agatha Christie, um, and um, and all of that could do uh, educational damage to the mind of a child because I was like I wanted to be everything. I wanted to be a teacher, depending on the character that I fell in love with. I wanted to be a speed racer, I wanted to be a Formula One driver because um, vehicles used to be brought to Volkswagen then in Lagos. And so when they drive the vehicles, the, the drivers that bring these combi buses were nearly reckless, but they drove like Formula One drivers, they would, and they were all in close uh, proximity, so they're just behind each other like that in a queue. And they would bring the cars from my papa to Volkswagen. And I thought, okay, maybe this is something that I will do. And then I, I was taken to sports as well. Uh, I played football. I did long jump. I, I did swimming. I, I did a lot of sports. So all of those were just, so I had a potpourri of ideas. I had a potpourri of choices. I, I didn't know which one to do. So it was just like, as I was growing, I was thinking of which one I would ferment into. Um, then I now took a major liking into writing and reading and uh, the stories that used to amuse me were the ones that I read in, um, in Sadness and Joy, uh, the Spare magazines and, um, and so I thought okay maybe a writer. Then I came in contact with the African Writer Series at that young age and I thought storytelling would be it and so I was going to go into television uh, or radio or become a broadcaster and by the time I was done with uh, primary school uh, I didn't do primary six because in primary five my dad said you, you go take common entrance I took the common entrance and I had such an amazing result and he said then straight to you secondary school and from secondary school and I met a lot of people that then reshaped the ideas and everything that I brought to school. Um, my dad then thought, being in command, I should go to the military school. And I said no. So you see that a lot of, there was an up and down hill of uh, of professional and occupational aspiration. And so I, the ups and downs now led me to thinking maybe I could become a lawyer, which was what my dad then agreed that I should be. Till I went to school and fate threw me into stand-up comedy by mistake. He said, Daddy, 
He said, I want you to go on a journey with me. In his mind, he thought they were traveling. <laughs> so he said, of course, uh -uh, I'm ready. I prayed for this. <laughs> Gio said, I knew that your faith would lead you here. You will go with me on a 40 days. Okay, who's going say yes? <laughs> Drive fast. He said, from today. He said, yes. Mm. He said, and that day, he had just given the wife money to cook Ophel Wiri. So he said, can we start next week? Gio said, that is why I knew that you will come. We will start now. He said, ah, why not? He said, they started first day. He's the one that was calling Gio. Gio, we've done the first day. Next day, we'll call Gio, let's pray. We've done the second day, Gio, let's pray. We've done the third day. On the fifth day, he didn't wake up early. Because he was hearing echo. <laughs> that he would just be lying there. He would hear wow, 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 wow. So it, it wasn't a plan. It wasn't, I, I didn't think, I didn't even know that I was funny. But I knew that I was quick on the take. And I was quick to respond. I was uh, sharp-witted. I, but I didn't count all of that. You know, all of it didn't chronicle into something like comedian. Oh, you're a funny guy. No, it was just like, it was me. Um, just like most of us then when we used to play football, none of us thought we were going to take it as a profession. We are just playing football and enjoying it. Um, quite a lot of people grow up like that. So you, you like singing, you go to church, you sing, you know, and you go back to your daily activity on Sunday, you come back, you sing and go back to your daily. None of us then, then says, let me take this singing into a professional level. I want to be a musician now. But that's, that's what then happened. I didn't think I was going to be a comedian. I like yellow eba, but we're fasting. It would be a guy called Percy Okoje. Uh, Percy Okoje organized an event in, uh, in Epoma. Uh, there's a place called the Pavilion. The pavilion is like the largest hall in uh, the school, which hosted Shino Peters, Charlie Boy, uh, Michael Cree, uh, Jaguar, uh, all of them, uh, Daniel Wilson, and all those people. And so, every time they brought an artist, uh, that was where they hosted it. And so, because pavilion was the biggest place in the whole of Ekboma. People will come from Miruekme, uh, Aochi, Poli, and all to attend events that were hosted there. Of course, uh, they had this beauty, uh, this concert, and uh, in the concert they they had a show. It wasn't a concert. They had a show, and one of the highlights of the show was a striptease. And for a lot of us who had come from Christian homes, a striptease was. A, a, not one of our aspirational uh, goals. We, we didn't grow up to saying one day I will see. It was not on the bucket list. And then we get to hear that there's a striptease and the lady was going to come on and she had been very popular. They had mentioned her in different Lagos Weekend uh, magazine, Punch, Vanguard and all of that. They've written about her and, um, and we said, oh, okay, let's see who this person is and so we went to watch the show then we called it the petticoat when she got to the petticoat students started trying to run on stage to go and touch her and it scared her she ran off the stage so i'm saying this story now because i think she is the one that gave me my break big break all right so she ran off the stage and students went gaga like it's not happening. She, she must come back. We paid either two naira or three naira to come and watch this show. She can't go. She must show us everything. And the organizers decided to come to me because before this, maybe I should lay this foundation. I've been a heckler, a professional heckler. So every show, everywhere I sit, you always find them in different universities. Those people that make noise a lot. If something is going on, they continue to ad lib or say something and just heckle whoever is on stage. 
it was my day job. So the organizers now called me and said, you know what, you have been doing this. Uh, and they said, can you now come and do it so that we can pacify this audience instead of doing it? Just come, please, please. So I went on stage and pacified everybody and started talking to them, Yabin school officials, uh, Doc Bae, our student affairs officer at the time, I picked on him, I picked on, uh, there was a driver in school, bus driver called Ayo, very tall guy, fine guy. Students liked him and hated him as well because uh, he will wait for some people that he knows when the bus is running late and not wait for some, you know. And so we had that, uh, but I managed to pacify the audience and so uh, the MCs were Fidelis Blackbone Onovugako, who was from Radio Bendel at the time, and uh, Stella, O oh Stella Ole. Uh, those are the, those were the MCs. And so they called me and said, okay, come and work with them and see how you can pacify the audience. And so that's what I did. So I pacified them, went backstage and told the lady, see, I'll bring you on to finish what you want to do. But you don't 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 be scared they won't do anything to you you just need to just and she was like they were coming on stage they were she's nearly i think she you know congo music was very popular at that time and so i think she was not nigerian her english sounded a bit french and and so i said okay uh, no problem she said okay you know what i'll do only you bring me on stage bring me on i said okay and she said please 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 don't let them come on stage. Tell them not to come on stage. I will show them everything. Don't let them not come on stage. I said, okay. So she came on stage. That's why I introduced her. I told them, I said, if you want to say, I then sit down. I said, anybody that gets up again, she will not come out. So in a sense, I became the MC, accidental MC of the show. And I now told some jokes and told some jokes and told some jokes and then brought her on. And she opened her this and she danced. She was dancing and dangling all her assets on the stage. And then she removed the uh, pants she was wearing, threw it into the audience and ran off. Oh, students went gaga. Anyway, I now wanted to go back and sit down. And the organizer of the show said, there's no way you go and sit down. So just continue. And that was the big break. That it is when you are fasting and they are cooking, that they open the cover of the pot. They will open it, the smell will take over. Zah! He turned and looked at the girl, get deep behind me. So in truth, I was introduced into entertainment by the, the happenstance of a striptease. Okay? Um, because I would have just gone to the show and not gone on stage. And if she had done her beat and left, then I wouldn't have even thought of being on stage. And so from then on, it became a, it became a regular thing in school that when there's a show, they will bring me. And um, everybody knew me then as Ali, um, but nobody called me Ali Baba. Uh, they, some would say resident Jamchuku. Uh, some would call me the away way of Bensu. Uh, but after a while, some guys now started writing Ali, you know, and gradually they added Baba. But that's, that's how I got on stage for the first time. The 40th day, Gio said, a spirit came to me. He said, Gio, I've not disobeyed you before. What spirit is this? Gio said, spirit said, we should fast 10 days for this country. He said, he nearly told him he was a Cameroonian. One, uh, the thing that makes uh, comedy a business is that we have um, we've become service providers. For anything to become a business, for you to be able to commercialize anything, you have to then tick the boxes that makes it a service. And so what we did was that uh, we, we saw that there was need for this service at events. You know, it is not like painting. There's a wedding you must paint there. Uh, people enjoy dancing, but they don't. It doesn't connect with the whole event as the event goes on. So, for comedy, it now became um, 
a staple after we started introducing it and people saw the relevance and the essence of the service to, so, so until we made people see it as a service that they needed it was hard it was a hard sell in the beginning because people didn't think oh, comedy no we were the last to be on the list and first to be cancelled out if the budget had been overstretched uh, people sometimes people didn't even remember that we were there you know but now we've moved from the fit realm of the entertainment estate to like the third uh, so now you have movies music and comedy um, before then you had music uh, stage uh, broadcasting that's television and radio personalities and then poets writers uh, and, and sportsmen then if comedians were even referred to it was like the big ones only the Baba Salah, the Samanja and, those, and most of them were television comedians um, there were no stand-up comedians as it were the people saw Jaguar who acted they saw Baba Suwe who was there they saw Papi Lue the Ojola Depot Theatre they saw the man in Coco Close Chifolu Alambe and you saw the rest of the people in Second Chance and um, people just saw TV comedians they did not see um, real stand-up and a hint of it started when uh, John Chuku was MC at national events and then would tell jokes and so so once once we got that out there and people then knew that this the value that we offered and imputed into their events added up in creating memories and making the guests feel okay uh, hilarity was part of the package and guests always enjoyed it people liked a good laugh everyone loved a good laugh so we caught on uh, the fees then became a problem people didn't think it was a serious job so pain was a problem so when you say i don't know i, know, I can't pay that kind of amount but with time the people who saw the value especially corporate nigeria that saw the value started using it and as they used it used our services and we had a lot more people join us so it was me uh alam blue uh mohammed danjuma tunji shotimi uh, a guy called saint jack ibo koko who was in Bini, in in port harcourt and we started pushing the envelope for me um the purpose of having a stand-up comedian grew to the point that guinness then brought satin brow a brand and needed to promote it and felt the best way to take this was to take it on a tour the drink the satin brow around nigeria which included going to bars restaurants and uh, hotels and they needed a comedian that could be spontaneous and take on those people because when people are drunk they don't want to listen to anything intellectual they just they just want to you to be on their frequency and so they we we did that and it was my big break that was um in 2004 2005 uh, we did the satin brow tour uh, i said 1994 1995 sorry 1994-1995 and from then on there was no looking back and you know nigerians like to protect themselves you will see a nigerian they're going when somebody else joins you you say all right the business of comedy has grown in the sense that um, a comedian who is worth his salt right now can charge between 4 million and 10 million uh, upcoming comedians enter the the industry now at uh, the entry fee that most of them charge now is 50,000 naira and if the comedian is good by the end of a year he probably would have climbed into the 150 200 category depending on how good he is and the frequency of his event so you actually you, you could see that and then the, we as comedians are now organizing a lot more events so we connect with a lot more customers than most art entertainers uh, if we're not at a wedding we are at a concert 
if we're not at a concert, we're at a comedy show, uh, or we're on TV, or we are used for a movie, or uh, so a birthday party, an anniversary, or something like that. So we, we connect with a lot more people, and we are easily integratable. Mm -hmm. you, you, you can bring us into a show and take us out quickly. Oh, just five minutes performance, 10 minutes performance, 20 minutes performance. Unlike when you want to bring a, a musical band or a choral group or, you know, so we, we, we kind of are like uh, portable. Mm -hmm. We're portable addition to every event. You can put us in and then uh, the plus that then make our business grow so fast was that it was better to kill two stones with two beds with one stone. You get a comedian, so becomes the MC. So that also helped us greatly. And uh, we, in, in in looking at all of these, the the public appreciation and acceptance of what we did as comedians grew. And and then you then come to the ultimate force of Obasanjo. When Obasanjo, yeah, you know, so that's it. <laughs> and Nigerians, we know sign language. You hear? He's the one that will be telling others when somebody's coming. They don't even know whether a person wants to join the queue. They say, behind here. He say, what of that one is not working? No, that's his phone. You know, the, the core part of any business that you do is understanding the business, first of all. What is the business? Of, so the art, and art, the art and art of comedy is making people laugh. The purpose of making people laugh is so that they can feel happy about themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason a client will want you to come and make his people laugh is so that they can experience that art. So, without mincing words, it means that um, as a comedian, you have to make people laugh. And it's still the same dynamics as it was when blacks started stand-up comedy. Um, the reason a lot of them who did stand-up comedy in the farms uh, wasn't called stand-up comedy at the time. It was just some black slaves entertaining in the farms. And how was it? It was that the masters would sit on their patio or sit in their balconies and have the black slaves sit down on the ground. And the ones that could speak the bastardized English as they, they could, uh, the broken English, were allowed to, to come on stage, to, to stand up and perform. So if you could dance, the master will come sit down and say, uh, who can dance? And then he'll show them how to dance. Then these are people who came from the hinterland of Africa. They knew how to dance. They knew how to sing. They knew how to tell stories. Uh, they knew how to play musical instruments. So all of them that knew how to do all of those will come sit down and when the master comes, they stand up and play. So master then gives them either extra food, extra clothes, and you know we're brought from this side and we had to be warm. And so clothes now became a currency. Shoes became a currency. Uh, taking a day off became a, a negotiable uh, part of your life. So if you could get a day off, you, you are okay. And as the slaves sat on the ground and any of them had a story to tell and stood up to tell the story in the most broken of all English, it connected with the, the white people who found it amusing, the, the, the slave masters found it amusing and just ticked them off. And so most times they then get to town and tell some of their friends and say, man, these boys, these black slaves, uh, killing us and so you come so gradually people started when uh, people now went to the to the farms and country homes to go watch these comedians perform and it started affecting pantomime and all those performances in theaters in town because a lot more people now found 
that it was better to come and watch these people entertain don't forget that we we started jazz music because of the fact that we couldn't speak the language but we could play musical instruments so the person you brought from Congo, the person you brought from uh, Edo, the person you brought from uh, Ashanti, uh, the person you brought from Congo, uh, the Zulus, the Hausa, the Kanuris and other people that you put into a ship and took to the farms, did not understand any of their languages, so they couldn't speak to themselves, but they could play musical instruments. So they could play the musical instrument without talking, which is how jazz started, okay? So in the farms, the master would like to enjoy the laughter more than listen to the music. And so the comedians had the, the, the slaves who could tell stories as, as broken as it was, now became the most uh, sought after people on this. So what it meant was that you then have to have stories to tell for you to remain in the limelight, for you to be able to be the go-to person. So the man will be like, okay, four of my friends are coming, come, come and tell us stories, which is like a part of Django, the story of Django. So in Nigeria, when the stand-up comedy thing started, there was need for you to have stories all the time. And so where do you get your stories from? From reading, from developing yourself. So the, the, the easiest ways are reading, observation just keep watching people people watching is a very good way to do so then listening to conversation and listening to people and then being able to <clears throat> to tie up all of this in very funny ways so a comedian needed to be either very studious reading any printed material or watching tv and movies <clears throat> And, and, and listening to radio and music because all of those then create materials that you can then make your jokes and humor from. Um, many times uh, people have asked how come some comedians make more money than some? Because if you can speak pidgin and you can speak English, it means that you can perform to the people who understand only pidgin and you can perform to people who understand only English. So it's like you're versatile. So you can perform to two markets. But if you are the one that speaks only pidgin English, when you bring the ambassador of Belgium and you want to entertain them, you won't call the one that can't connect with them. Because uh, until the joke you're telling or whatever you're telling can permeate their humor sense, sense of humor, then the, the joke is lost. As a worry boy, when I came to Lagos and I started charging plenty money, my mom did not know how much I used to charge for events until she came. We were living in Ikoye at the time. So we, my wife built a library on the outside because she knows I like to read in the night and I can't read in the room, so she built a library. So that library is where I stay. My mom stays in the living room and could hear conversations that I have with customers. One day, some guys came, Ali, we want you to do an event. I said, 2.5. They said, Ali, uh, no, 1.5. I said, no. My mom was listening. The guy said, Ali, do two. I said, lie, lie. They got up and were leaving. My mom is an horrible woman. So my mom came. To you, ta. What are you, two million? I said, Ijo, when you're a thief. And my mom walked out and uh, yeah, yeah, tell them that they come, he don't agree. So, uh, being educated um, helps. If you notice, a larger crop of the comedians you have now are graduates. Uh, some have PhDs, some have masters, uh, some have first degrees. Uh, diplomas and the rest of them is just like a common place now, but a lot of them are very educated. And um, comedy is a very, how would I say, it's a very high level of performance in the sense that y you don't finish a performance and somebody then says, oh, I think I like the music or it was not so good. No, it's immediate. If you're not funny, it shows. So it, it, it's, uh, it, it's more demanding um, to, it's like a hundred meters dash. You, you, you don't have all day to prove to somebody like a marathon that you can do it. 
it's a hundred meters dash if you can't drop which is why we started developing spontaneity because everyone knows that if your mom starts to teach you how to call that two million in your language you spend three days that's hundred thousand. I said, I don't take him now. The first, the first thing that I that I knew uh, when I when I started reading up um, stories of uh, comedians in in America and in the UK and was that a comedian is as fresh as the last jokes that he had told. So being dynamic was important. And being able to use current affairs also helped a lot of people to connect with you because then they could relate with you faster. Uh, I say that because if I start telling you story of something of 1964, 1965, and I have to bring you up to date before I then tell you the joke, because you may not be able to connect with it. Some days now, if you tell a joke about, oh, Molue, some children of 16, 17, 18 years will be like, Molue. But they will get a joke of Kekena Pep faster. So a comedian needed to be more dynamic and current with his ideas. How I have stayed is that I, I made a vow to myself that I was going to be creating new jokes regularly. And to get those new jokes means that you have to get <clears throat> new experiences, embed yourself in new experiences every time so that you can milk the humor out of it. So it's from watching TV, it's from listening to news, it's from talking with a lot of people, it's from reading newspapers, it's from um, skimming. Uh, information from books and everything that you read, magazines and anything, anything at all, or listening to people and hearing the other things that they don't say, uh, mannerisms, uh, character flaws, and uh, uh, national issues. So, pressing the refresher button is, to, to put it mildly uh, and straight, is pressing the refresher button is one reason that has sustained me till now. Uh, I was uh, talking with someone the other day, I said I've, I've done stand-up comedy now for over 30 years. Uh, from 1987-88 that I started doing stand-up comedy till now, um, I look back and I see people who are in other forms of entertainment, who in the 30 years of their career have either fizzled out because they did not grab and take advantage of those things and dynamics that sustain uh, an artist. For instance, Facebook came. Uh, it became a newer platform for people to share ideas, learn more from people and continue to, to grow your information base. Some people shied away from it. No, online, no, no, no. Twitter came. You could, you could express yourself and share ideas and continue to expand your mind greatly some of them finally made it to facebook and refused to go to twitter then locked themselves down it just means that if you do not embrace new technology you will not and i say you will not be uh, you, you you will not grow you will not you will not remain relevant and you know i was telling you about my mom my mom is the type that comes to church early, sits right in front, and will comment on every testimony. One guy came, praise the Lord! I have just been promoted, and uh, they don't give me better salary now. My mom took phone. This is your turn and turn, not they pay, they don't increase in salary. Oh. The reason I've still been here uh, is that I have uh, worked hard to make sure that I do not let my past glory tie me down from extending myself to the future. But it is to look at how impactful and effective any connection that we make is. And so now the connections that we have are through Instagram, Twitter, one-on-one -on -one contacts, networking, and those are the things that are working. 1996 and 97, I did billboards. 
one in front of uh, Lagos State Government, Governor's House, one at Foreshot Towers, and one where Civic Center is standing right now. So when you come down at the Tokumba Demola, it's just right in front of you, just in front of the gates. That was where the billboard was. It was very impact, impactful and effective because my, my pager number was there from disk engineering. That's the other thing. I use technology. At the time that I got the uh, pager number, I think it was just me, Mohamed Danjima, and TA who had the pager number. I had pager number 197. TA had, I think, 274. And we, we used the pager numbers to grow our business to a place where it was acceptable and we could connect with a lot of people. We were reachable at all the time, or, um, at any point in time. So we used technology to our betterment. When movies started coming out, we were renting movies and watching the movies. Uh, we had uh, two uh, movie places that we were renting movies from. Uh, Morphe's, Morphe's had a movie, uh, then uh, this, um, uh, Mega Plaza had a movie place as well on uh, Adiola Hopewell. So we're going there, then Lagoons opened another movie st store. So we're going there to take movies. So those are the ways of using technology to improve yourself. When Laser Disc came, we bought Laser Disc and watched comedy performances by Richard Pryor, Eddie Murphy, uh, Bill Cosby, and all of them because we needed to improve our act. A lot of people did not see that. We, we used the libraries that were available to us. So British Council, uh, USIS, that was what they were called at the time. Uh, we were going to their libraries and using their libraries. And they were buying books. So when I say we, it was that I made sure that I inculcated that into TA, Mohamed Danjuma, Obolo Singa, um, Basaj, and a lot of the people that came around, around me at the time. Um, a white uh, basket mouth and all of them who came on after we made them see that this was the thing that was sustaining us and so a lot of them took to either the videos and VHS some took to the books and some took to listening to people and watching people those three core elements helped us remain uh, relevant and I I can say clearly that beyond having being intelligent or from having read so many books it is applying those core values of getting information from anywhere that has sustained me to this level okay praise the lord i'm uh, in school of nursing i am preparing for my exam i want everybody here to pray for me as i'm going for this exam because the first one i did i passed but this one that i want to do now i will pass it well well praise the lord my mom said you don't fail when they come, they pray like this, they don't fail. And then... <laughs> it was amazing. It was amazing. I... The, the first, first day I got a call, um, and the person said, my name is J.A.J. Uh, I was like, hey, hey, JJ, because I'd known JJ from uh, Martin Street, uh, Radio Nigeria. Uh, and young man, he's free, free, and his love for hip hop and rap music. A lot of people do not know that rap music is about poetry, not the ones they do now, not the hurted and hurting there, hurting there. No, I mean, real core rap is poetry in uh, motion. And so I. I'd known him and he's, he's also, he could tell a bit of my journey. And to think that, you know, I'm beginning to get used, let me just say that I'm beginning to get used to these surprises or people beginning to recognize that uh, com comedy has beyond just entertaining a major role in the society. Uh, I rang the closing bell of uh, Nigerian Stock Exchange in 2012 and when I did it was the first time and I ran into uh, Aliko some days after and he said do you know what that means and I said oh no they invited me to, to ring the bell he said they ringing the bell of a stock market the biggest stock market in the whole of Africa 
should tell you something. It should tell you that whatever you're doing has been recognized. Your impact is understood by the market and your relevance is then heightened again with this ringing of the closing bell. Closing bell, that's the closing bell for the year. And um, it, it speaks to how much you have done for your industry. I felt very humbled more humble than the day that I received the bell, the, that I did the ringing of the bell. <laughs> One day, the pastor came to church and then another man said, oh, he has a testimony. The guy, you know people that come to church to do testimony and then you get somebody to interpret the testimony because the people in the church don't understand pigeon. So this guy speaks only English. So the guy comes and says, okay, pastor said, um, uh, Mrs. Salome Yakobome would interpret. <laughs> My mom took the microphone and I talk. The guy said, so one day I was coming back from work. Saying they come back from work. Oh. My car broke down. In car spoil. And then, you know, the pastor now said, you need to put more life into it. My mom said, okay. He said, so my car got spoiled. He said, my car spoiled. So I called a mechanic. I called mechanic. So right there, where I was uh, waiting for the mechanic to come, arm robbers came. Arm robbers come, come. And they met me there. They meet them there. The presidency gave me a national honor. Also in recognition of what I had done, because then it's now in micro business, micro small business. And so it now came to me really that it must mean that all the stuff that we've been doing has done more than just entertain, it has created an industry that is now recognized by a lot of people. And so when I was mentioned as man of the year and given the Lifetime Achievement Award, it hit me that we, we actually set up, started, created an industry from nothing and it's now being recognized. I, I felt very humbled. I felt very honored and which was why when I went up on the stage, like you rightly mentioned, I dedicated it to the people before us who created the path uh, from uh, uh, Papi Lue, Benga Deboye, that's the name that I need to mention as often as possible. Benga Deboye, who master talent of storytelling, uh, awesome, uh, spontaneous comedian, uh, Bisio Latilo, Patrick Doyle, um, this, these people, the, then Tony St. Ike, there's a guy called Tony St. Ike uh, who's passed on as well now. Um, the, these, these people helped us greatly. And then Mohammed Danjuma, it, it's good to mention these people that were before us and so that we can then let people know where we came from as we pass the torch on to the next this thing. I, I was honored, I was, in fact, the but I couldn't take the glory by myself because there were a lot of people who were stepping stones and ladders for us to get to where we were. Um, first of all, I'll say thank you to God Almighty that makes everything possible. And um, I want to say a big thank you to Silver Bear for this. Uh, before now, comedy was like the fifth or sixth realm of the entertainment sector. There was movies, there was stage acting, there was music, there were te television broadcasters, and then you started talking about comedians. But I want to be give a big shout out to people like John Chuku, Bisio Latilo, Baba Salah, Samanja, the first Agodai, <laughs> the first Agodai, away, away. Uh, I, I think that those people paved the way for us and we carried on the torch. And I want to thank everybody, especially the people that gave us our first breaks. Uh, Dala Dibako here put me on morning ride against all that everybody said. Bisio Latilo gave me the first radio performance and I was on radio with BCL Latilo, Radio Nigeria 3, which was the first pigeon radio. I, the man that just left here, uh, body, body, 
Bode George. Bode George was the person that introduced me to Mr. President um, Obasanjo when he came out from prison. And Obasanjo said, they told him we have a comedian and he's a very good comedian and Obasanjo was expecting Babasala. And when I came out, everything I said, Obasanjo would say something and just interrupt me. And Bode George said, sit down and listen to him and you will enjoy yourself. And from that day, Obasanjo put our entertainment as comedy on the front burner. I thank everyone and sitting at, you know, there's something else, all the corporate bodies that have helped us to grow. God bless all of you. God bless all of you. One of them is NNPC. And the lady that introduced me to NNPC is here. Please give Ifi and Wakwisi a round of applause. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is to all the comedians that are here on stage. Are the comedians step forward? Okay, Bakasi. Where is, it? Where is uh, Wari Pike? Come. Okay. So they're all, they're all here. Ladies and gentlemen, we thank all of you for supporting us. Please continue to pay us. <laughs> because this business is not a joke. I want to help them see that this job is not about just cracking the jokes. It's a business and you are worth more than you think you are now. And how do I do that? I, I give them a brand new car through the spontaneity competition that we organize all through the year. The, the reason for giving them the car is so that they know that they are worth more than that. If somebody gives you a car and you are just a, a young hustler, it takes out one of the very important thing of from A to B. So if you are, if you are an upwardly mobile comedian, it means that your hustle has been reduced. And if you are wise enough, you could uh, use that to drive yourself to greatness. Pardon the pun. Um, so I'm committed to that, that spontaneity. Um, and I started since 2016. Uh, I've given, so far, I've given out five cars. Uh, we're looking at doing a lot more. Um, there's, a, there's a plan in the offing to even get into accommodation uh get maybe like uh two four bedrooms uh on both sides one for ladies and one for guys and have comedians stay there and as your career grows you move out and let somebody else come in uh i'm committed to i i i let anybody use my jokes from any any level at all just just use it uh, and this was because um, a friend of mine of blessed memory Ferry Ozako told me that um, even American idols the artists that come to contest don't do the original songs they use the songs of the greats to as a launch pad to test their abilities to and, and their creativity so I I take that as my my yardstick for for doing what I'm doing, uh, I, I believe that using that means uh, providing that platform means that you give a lot of comedians uh, the ability to know that you don't need to cram a joke. You just need to be spontaneous. Just continue to build the sense of humor in you to a commercial level, and that you're spontaneous at the drop of a hat. All right. Then I organize the January first concert. Now the reason for January first concert is, uh, which was like in it, from when I set up Excuse Me, we've been thinking and just rubbing it off and then knocking it all around in the head. And a fairy again, a fairy Zako, my brother, uh, told me, Ali, do this thing, do this thing, because every January first, we hang out in my house. He and my uh, other brother James, they'll come. We'll sit down. We'll eat. We'll drink. We'll make noise. All to the. But you know, we'd have done crossover service, and so we we'll sleep and wake up about like 10, 12, and then the whole of the day we we'll then begin to do all of that. Don't forget, cinemas were not uh, a big thing at the time. So I said, I think I should be organizing a January first concert that people will come. 
You know, naysayers are the ones that like to kill any dream. They called me, who, who wants to come to your thing? It's New Year, everybody wants to stay at home. I said, no, people, because there's nothing to do. That's why people have not gone out. If you have something, people will come. And so we started planning in 2014. We planned and planned and planned. Of course, I lost uh, Ifira Zako and, uh, in 2015 and uh, shook me up. And I said, oh man, we must start doing January 1st. And so we started doing January 1st. And January 1st was for us to chronicle everything that had happened in the year and make fun of all the things. So it was like a year in review. And then it was now to let people come and celebrate the new year and, and bring people together. So it was like um, a boost for the new year instead of sit at home and do nothing. So we organized that and it picked up. Uh, in fact, people did not think that we would sell out the distance. We sold out and people were begging for tickets. And the first uh, uh, edition and then subsequent edition sometimes will we'll get sold out before a week to the event and uh, thank god uh, a lot of uh, people have supported us greatly uh, delta state government um, uh, lagos state government uh, have have supported supported me greatly um, i think that um, so, so I decided and I, I thought about it and I decided that there was no need to just do that. I also thought there was need to thank God. You know, th American Thanksgiving is in November, but we, we don't have a Thanksgiving in Nigeria. So I said, okay, since we do crossover service and we already set up the hall before the day of January 1st, why not let's have a gospel concert and then use that gospel concert to, to go into the new year. Don't forget that. Most times, if you go to crossover services, you see Muslims. They attend the crossover service just to praise God and then go to... Uh, it, it, and then even now, some mosques will organize a crossover service. So we want to do an interdenominational crossover service. So we're starting this year. So on the 31st of December, we'll do that one. And then on the 1st, we'll do January 1st. Uh, then for my Alibaba returns, it's that I've always been thinking there's no need to go outside Nigeria to go and perform. But you see, like they say, a, an old man will not see as much as a traveling young man. And so I, last year I said, okay, let's go to London. And so we went, went did Alibaba finally. And after Alibaba finally, now we're doing Alibaba returns. Uh, Next year, I, I know we'll, we'll still we'll continue to do it, and we sold out as well. They bet about things. You know, here in Lagos, when somebody is reversing, and you see gutter. Hey, Sofu, Sofu, hey, hey, ah, Sofu. Then they will go and tap on the ah gutter. Say, worry. Said they watch and they go enter, go down. They look and they look and they say, I know go enter. That guy get all reverse camera. They watch him. You won't bet. You won't bet. Then you went out, and I'll tell you. Uh, the relationship I have with Baba was uh, ignited through uh, Body George. Uh, Body George, Commodore Body George, was. Um, was very close to Baba and so when Baba became the president and he had his birthday but the judge then arranged for me to come come perform in uh, in 1999 now don't forget that a a, a career wave had been built from 1990 so 1990, 1991, 1992, we're making inroads into different places. I was performing in barracks. I performed for Abacha, performed for IBB, I performed for Usaini and all of all those people. Uh, Ugbeha, uh, Aikomu, and all of them, all the big boys. You know, the military were in power at the time. So all that time that all of that was going on, Baba was in prison. <laughs> 
Baba was in prison. So when he came out of prison, at the time he came out of prison, the comedy that I was doing had become so accepted. But he was not aware. And so when they told him that they were bringing a comedian, he told me that he was expecting to see somebody like Baba Salah. And uh, our Dakeri Keri. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> he... The performance was going, he was sitting down out the and um, uh, Daisy Danjuma, okay, so Daisy Danjuma's husband, so uh, Theophilus Danjuma was sitting by him with uh, the man of blessed memory, uh, Bola Ige. And so they were sitting down and all of that was going on. Then they said, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Don't You Cook Me then introduced me and said, uh, a surprise performance from a comedian uh, from Niger Delta from his name is Ali Baba and uh, Baba was looking at me like so he interrupted nearly everything that I said but when I finally got him he was laughing and slapping everybody around him he was just very happy and subsequently every event that happened in the villa he would request that they, br they brought me to perform and so I was a regular, uh, I was a staple on the entertainment calendar of the villa. And what then happens is that a lot of people then started using my services because they saw me with Baba. But this is a part that a lot of Nigerians do not know. Baba then became my marketing manager. He promoted me more than I promoted myself. So they called Baba for a one day visit, state visit presidential visit and they want Baba to spend two days Baba will say okay so you organize dinner I say yeah, then bring Ali Baba and so the state governor would then look for every means to contact me and say you must come so sometimes they use journalists editors and other ones to reach out to me or advertising agencies and say can you get Ali Baba the other ones will call me and say uh, we need you in uh, Kaduna we need you in Sokoto we need you in uh, Bochi we need you in Bono you know and I was wondering how were all of this coming? And then you then see that you get there, you see president is coming, we have a dinner, a gala night, and we want you to perform. I said, okay, I'll get there. I'll do it. Sometimes BC is the MC, sometimes CK Nanda Goba is the MC, sometimes uh, Eugenia Abu, but something like that. We just keep working. And until one day, we had something in uh, Kaduna. Um, I think it was uh, Shinkafe. No, no. Uh, the governor of Kaduna uh, uh, invited Baba, and so I. They negotiated with me. I told them my fees. They said they were not going to pay. So they got the message to Baba that, oh, uh, that I will not perform. Baba said it's not coming, oh. And that was when the governor, the, the press secretary, then called me and said, hold on for Malga. He said, what is you and this Baba's own self that, that he said he won't come if you say you won't. So better come, oh, better come. Settle everything with them and come. So, so I went. That day when Baba came, after he had come, I took the national anthem. He now called me and said, did they not tell you that I'm the one that said that you should come? I said, I said, yes, sir. He said, hey, so where's my own court now? <laughs> so I said, I said, ah, you don't, he said, ah, they won't call you again, no. <laughs> so he, he and I, you know, that that day but then again it, it also speaks to his sense of humor if he were somebody that didn't have a sense of humor he would not have uh it's like yaradwa when yaradwa came i thought it was going to continue by the way yaradwa's um uh inauguration and uh, campaigns and all of those i was part of it so we're going to casina myself and uh lepashos bosse went for some of, of his uh, this thing. And Baba now introduced me to him and said, this is uh, Ali Baba. He's been performing at all those things. Here I do, I said, I don't like laughing. <laughs> so, so I was telling Baba, tell him to like laughing, you know, because, you know, um, but we still we still did a bit of events with uh, Yaradwa. Uh, then we we became close through his wife, uh, Auntie Stella. Uh, Auntie Stella started using my services as well uh, for a lot of events. Uh, myself, uh, Ronke Belo, 
um, we, we did quite a lot of events for her so that uh, it, it, now be, it now went more than just performing. So sometimes Baba just calls me or he, they will just call me and say, hold on for number one. And he will take the call and we will just, we'll, we'll just gist. And sometimes I, I, I'll be like, I'm so honored to be talking with him. And then when we finish talking, he will say, a lot of people do not know how sound your mind is that people do not know how sound your mind is. Sometimes he, he will call and just sound me out on certain things. And then I, his, his insight into the Nigeria that we have is amazing. So you, you sometimes just hear him talk about certain things and you are like, so why didn't you do that? I said, I tried. I tried, there were so many people that I was fighting against I said, and, I, and I knew. Then we had this personal joke, like the time they said that uh, he bribed the National Assembly and they put the bags of money on, the, on television and said the, the presidency sent this money to bribe the uh, National Assembly. And he said they should go and collect the money that he's not giving them the money. If, if they said that he sent that money, go, 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 you know. And then uh, the popular joke that I did about him uh, when he stumbled on the committee that were planning a show and uh, wanted to... Because he calls me Uli. That's another thing. He calls me Uli. Uh, Olosha. Uh, I, I, didn't, I thought that Olosha means like a stupid boy until I heard that he was thief in Yoruba language. <laughs> when he found out how much I was earning. Because all the while, I thought he knew how much I was earning when he was telling them to always call me for events, you know, until he found out <laughs> how much I was earning. Um, so our, our relationship was also, and then when Stella died, I, I went to greet him in Abelkuta. And while everybody was crying, I got there and I was crying and he said, I, they held me and said, I know how close you were. I know you, you know, your mommy has gone to a better place. And I said, I, said, I know, but, it's not, it's not the death that is paining me, that is my balance <laughs> <laughs> for her 60th that I was supposed to be paid. He was pursuing me around. <laughs> the, the steady balance that, uh, that I have is uh, greatly to her credit. Uh, she's been able to, to handle the home front while I'm not there. She's... Uh, She's created, like I said, a steady balance uh, for family. And so she actually is very pivotal to uh, my, my family, her family, and she's like a bonding glue that keeps everybody together. Uh, she also has uh, greatly helped with uh, financial advisory. Uh, and having also read first degree as theater arts, in, in theater arts, uh, she's a thespian, but uh, the rest of her life from uh, 1990 till now has been uh, in banking and financial advisory. She's uh, also, she's a great money manager and that, that is reflected in a lot of things that I did. Um, a wonderful home home person. So after all the noise and che che che, as she would uh, say, you come back home to be a father, come back home to be a husband, and and she lets you go out there and uh, and be Alibaba, but come back home to be Atunyota. So yes, she she's done that very well. The last thing is she has a great sense of humor, and so she can tolerate a lot of things, and she's forgiven a lot of my excesses as well. Um, she's a wonderful person, wonderful person. Waiting for the big break, develop yourself. And there are several instances when that kind of thing had happened. It is not the day they say 100 meters senior boys that you then begin to prepare to learn how to run. So it is for people to always learn to it. Some people tell you, oh, when you say, the people call in and say, I'm looking for a job. They say, what can you do? They say, when I get there, I'll learn. That's not, you're supposed to hit the ground running. The reason exams are organized for people is so that 
what you have learned, you then show that you already know it. We have a generation of people who say, hey, give me first, then I'll try. People do not prepare themselves. So it is like preparation plus opportunity equals success. So people miss that preparation part and want success because they think the opportunity will create the success. No, the opportunity, like most people say, uh, help me find work. When I give you the contact to go there to get the work, what you do after they give you the job is what then shows that you are ready. People who have done things for themselves now got it without government. They got whatever they achieved now without government. Uh, was it government that made uh, Peace Square? It wasn't government that made Banky W. It wasn't government that made uh, Whiskey. And when you then say that, they now say, hey, you know, uh, Banky W stood behind Whiskey for Whiskey to. But if Whiskey didn't have a talent, will he grow him?